When you buy Kroger brand products, you feel like you're winning. That's because they offer proven quality at lower than low prices. In fact, we guarantee that you and your family will love how Kroger brand products taste. Or you get your money back. So next time you're shopping for the family, look for delicious Kroger brand products. Because they'll make you all feel like you're winning. Shop now, in-store, or online. Bakers, fresh for everyone. The South Dakota Stories, Volume 7. My trip to South Dakota was the best summer ever. Now I don't need to go to Mars because I've been to the Badlands. And I caught a bigger walleye than Dad when we went to the Missouri River. Then I rode my bike through these huge rocks called needles. Ooh, I also saw my first herd of bison, even a fuzzy furry baby one. I can't wait to go back and see more. There's so much South Dakota, so little time. State Farm and DJ Dramos from Life as a Gringo know that getting your money right brings freedom, empowerment, and future success. The mindset work that it takes to retrain your brain to believe that you are someone who can obtain anything you want financially and hit all of those financial goals and that the only thing holding you back is is yourself. I love how she talks about like just demanding how much you believe you're worth, how much you want to make, and how you have to make that declaration. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Let me just run this by my lawyer is a really helpful phrase to have in your back pocket. Legal Shield has been giving legal peace of mind for over 50 years. They connect you to a vetted law firm in your state for an affordable monthly fee. Want an experienced set of eyes on a contract's fine print? Or you finally want to get that will done? Legal Shield has a dedicated group of lawyers who have your back, no matter what the future brings. Sign up today at LegalShield.com forward slash iHeart. PPLSI does not provide legal representation or advice. See a plan for complete terms. We are back, and I'm back with my good friend, Kevin Queen. Hello, Kevin. Welcome back. Hey, Leanne. Good to be back. Yes. Thanks for having me back on. Yes. Well, last episode was a powerhouse, and I think, you know, one of the things that's really helpful and was helpful for me is, you know, meeting myself in my doubt, right? Because when we talk about this idea of believing in what you can't yet see or smell or taste or touch, you know, that's part of what faith is. And, you know, sometimes we have to meet ourselves in our doubt to bring ourselves over to a new sense of certainty or really dipping our toes into the next level of what we want to try on. So one of the things, the big things that kept coming up for me were, and, and I talk about this in the work that I do with with my clients, is we have these beliefs, you know, and it's really just thoughts that we think over and over again, and then they become beliefs, they become a download of what we perceive to be true about ourselves. And then we live in these beliefs, and we think that they're true, or we think that they're real, because they feel real. And then they become part of our identity. They become part of our self-image and they turn into those I am statements like, Mm. oh, I am this way or this is just what I do. This is just who I am. And I think some of the beliefs that I had to really just come to head with and and really just unveil, so to speak, so I could reveal them and not have them really kind of sabotage what I was thinking and doing and saying needed to be brought to light for me to even see that they were kind of keeping me far from God and keeping me from thinking that I was worthy of having this relationship with God. So some of the ones that came up for me, some of the ones that um, my clients have shared with me have come up for them when they're entering into the spiritual conversation. And I'd love to just get your take on them, hear what you say, hear what scripture says, because I think part of it too is it's easy for us to recognize when something's not true or that it can't be true. But then what is the new truth? Yeah. What actually resonates with us? You yeah. know, and it's a big departure to be like, oh, I'm so broken. I'm awful to no, I'm so lovable. It's not a jump like that. It right. can't be. We've got to meet ourselves in our doubt. So before we dive in, I'd love to hear like just what are your thoughts about the beliefs that come up for us and that we download and walk around with and just kind of share share your take on that. Yeah, I think that so much of our battlefield is in our mind. Right. And 
there's a movie called The Usual Suspects, and at the end of The Usual Suspects, it's talking about one of the greatest tricks that the that Satan ever used was uh, convincing people that he doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, but I think one of the one of the evidences of gosh of the way that the enemy that Satan works, and Jesus said, you know, he said Satan is like a like a lion who prowls around looking for who he would devour. He he said, I've come, I've come to would have abundant life. He said, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the ways that he steals our joy and that he he kills our hope and that he destroys like life to the full are with these um what I would call like defeatist beliefs, you know, and these these which truly are lies. Yeah. He's the father of lies. That's another way that Jesus talks about him and and he's he's a counterfeiter yeah. you know and so like really they call him the father hey, you're a father of things you create the only thing that Satan ever created was lies mm. and so so many of us and it's so easy to get entangled in and lies that have been informed maybe from our for our past and maybe aren't part of that new truth so what I'd love to do I mean is we kind of talk maybe talk through some of those lies or some of those thoughts and how do we replace those lies with truth and maybe the way we get to some truth you you said something last episode you talked about putting on a new story Mm -hmm. and so what if we put on some new stories and and look at some stories of how jesus um, interacted with people in the gospels Mm -hmm. and what i hope people understand is that god is not a favorite persons all right so he loves everybody we're all we've all been created in the image of god he loves everybody the same and it's his will that all, it's his desire that all would come to know him. Yeah. And so maybe what we can do is see ourselves as some of these people in the yeah. in the gospels and to see the way the disciples were like, Jesus, if you show us the Father, we'll believe. And he's like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, if you want to know what God looks like, look at me. Yeah. And so let's let's find truth. Like Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. Let's find truth by looking at Jesus and the way that he treats people. You know, and the way that he interacts with people who maybe would have believed some of these lies. Is that cool? So, so okay. I think that's a beautiful framework. So let's just dive right in. You yeah. know, one, this is a big one, but, you know, the first belief or lie that comes up and keeps people far from God or keeps them from having a relationship is I'm too broken or I'm too far gone. Yeah. What do you say about that one? You know, I think that for me, that resonates for when I was arrested at 16, like being in the back of a police car. And I think about like in that moment, I'm like, man, I had lived this double life for so long, but there was the moment where I was like, okay, am I going to follow Jesus or am I going to go ride in the back of police cars so I could walk in the future? But this, this, the lie in that moment was I'm too far gone, like that I can't come back from this moment, that this is going to be my history, you know, forever. And I think we've probably all had moments like that where a lie like that comes in. I think about this one guy, his name was um, Legion and he lived on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is like a region called the Decapolis. And it said that he lived in the tombs and he had chains that had been broken and he cut himself with rocks. So here's this guy who is just tormented either from things that have happened to him or things that has passed. Jesus takes the disciples and they go on a boat ride to the Decapolis to the other side. They get over there and it says this man runs at Jesus. So think about it. Like you're one of the Talmudim. You're one of the disciples. You're like, this is it. Like this is how the Messiah goes down. Like some <laughs> crazy. And they said the man was naked. Some crazy naked man running at the okay. Messiah like to take him. He's, he's, got that, he's living among the tombs. It's like this man is too far gone in their perspective. And Jesus has a conversation. He comes to me, falls at Jesus' feet. Jesus heals him. Next thing we know, the man is like dressed and in his right mind, the townspeople are coming out going, what has happened? The man pleads with Jesus and he's like, let me go with you. And Jesus said, no, go home and tell your story. I go tell your family. He sends him back to his family. I love that story because if anybody was too far gone, it was this man who people knew as legions, you know, this man who was living among the tombs, like, and Jesus goes to the, I believe Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee the lake, right? They went to the other side of the lake for this one man, just to, so that we would have a picture to go, nobody's too far gone, you know? And that that's how he meets us in that place. If we just if we come to him, that he can bring us freedom and he can reveal to us who we truly are. And then he sends us back, you know, back into life to be, to live out that new identity in yeah. him. So Absolutely. And I remember when I first started, again, learning about this guy called Jesus, 
you know, I would hear him like, yeah, he he hung out with murderers and adulterers and, you know, thieves and all these things. And it's not that he was condoning it, right? right. So I think part of this idea of of healing really and coming and coming home to yourself and going home mm -hmm. is is really acknowledging, hey, yes, I have shame, but this isn't who I want to be any longer and right. really renewing and, and committing to that transformation. It's not this like, oh, I have Jesus. It's a get out of jail free card to, to just keep sinning and keep shame and, you know, keep doing the thing that's causing shame. Right. There's obviously an element of, you know, restoration and renewal. Yeah. But don't disqualify yourself from being being worthy of, of that yeah. because of your shame. And maybe what we do is draw a distinction between guilt and shame. Yes. So Thank guilt you. says, I've done a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, shame says I am a bad person. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the toxic shame piece. Yeah. And so I think, you know, we talked about like the way Satan works here. One of the things that just made, that makes me like when I think back about like temptation. So temptation, we might be tempted to, to do a certain thing. Like let's say the temptation to lie, to not tell the truth. And so we get in a situation, maybe you get in a situation at work and my, do I tell the truth or do I lie? If I lie, I get out of it. And so we were like, nah, I don't need to, lie. but then we, Come, we just tell the lie. The, the temptation before is, hey, if you tell this lie, nobody's going to know. Everything's going to be easier. You're going to get through this. Not a big deal. But then the moment you tell the lie and then the shame comes in, you're a liar. You're a loser. Everybody's going to know. The way that things shift in that moment, for me, that's more of an apologetic mm -hmm. or an understanding of like that evil and that Satan and that lies and temptation like is really goes back to there is this there is this force at play to pull us away from who we're created to be yeah. you know and and so the way that lies work that shame that comes after that moment yeah. that says you're a bad person at first it was just do a thing yeah. and then it became a part of, well this is part of your identity and I'm just like that's that's just the way that that Satan works is evidence of that the father of lies Absolutely. Like what you did is not who you are and where you are is not who you are and your circumstances are not who you are. And I think we confuse the two and we take what we did and we identify as the, the thing. And right. that's what turns into toxic shame. And when it doesn't get acknowledged and shine a light on and then, of course, the secrecy that usually comes alongside shame, it just festers and then builds on layer on top of layer. So, yeah, that's such an important distinction. And it's interesting. The second belief and or lie that I was going to talk about is that my shame is different or worse than others. So I think we talked about this a little bit last time where we kind of categorize our shame, you know, and again, just talking about, you know, Jesus hung out with not condoning, but, you know, murderers, adulterers, you know, all the things and, I, uh, you know, all the things that you hear about that come up in in your church community, whether, you know, you have men that are addicted to porn or sex or women, too, I'm sure, you know. I know I deal with a lot of women that have, you know, they feel addicted to sugar and food, whether it is, you know, adultery, drugs, crime, whatever it is, you know, and there's testimony after testimony of testimony of, you know, becoming a new creation. But what do you say about if somebody has a belief of like, no, you don't understand, like that shame is fine. Like that can be forgiven. But my shame, no. You're probably careful with your personal information, but what about the other places that have it? Like the doctor's office that mixed up your files. They have your social security number. The power company that mistakenly cut your service has your payment info and last three addresses. And the hotel that lost your reservation has your passport info. Your information is in endless places out of your control. Any one of them could accidentally expose you to hackers and identity theft through lax security, breaches, or simple mistakes. But LifeLock monitors millions of data points every second and alerts you to a wide range of threats. If your identity is stolen, a U.S.-based restoration specialist will fix it, guaranteed, or your money back. With plans covering up to $3 million for stolen funds and expenses. Mistakes happen. Don't let not having protection be one of them. Save up to 40% your first year at lifelock.com slash iHeart. That's lifelock.com slash iHeart to save up to 40%. Terms apply. Hi, I'm Cindy Crawford, and I'm the founder of Meaningful Beauty. 
Well, I don't know about you, but like I never liked being told, oh, wow, you look so good for your age. Like why even bother saying that? Why don't you just say you look great at any age, every age? That's what Meaningful Beauty is all about. We create products that make you feel confident in your skin at the age you are now. Meaningful Beauty. Beautiful skin at every age. Learn more at MeaningfulBeauty.com. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand. It's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. If I asked you, how many subscriptions do you have? Would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying? Now, if you would have asked me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes. But let me tell you, I would have been so wrong. I can't believe how many I had. You know, like those annual subscriptions you forget about until they charge your credit card? I was wasting a ton of money on those. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, I have full control now over my subscriptions and a clear view of my expenses. And if I see something I don't want, Rocket Money can help me cancel it with just a few taps. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped them save a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop doing it. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash podcast. That's rocketmoney.com slash podcast. Rocketmoney.com slash podcast. What do you say about if somebody has a belief of like, no, you don't understand, like that shame is fine. Like that can be forgiven, but my shame, no. So I think the in, the enemy's strategy it, are secrets and isolation, mm-hmm. you know, and then you probably heard it said, like, we're only as sick as our secrets. So in the scriptures, it talks about confess your sin to one another and you'll be healed. You probably heard it said, like, that we're only as sick as our secrets. And if we confess our sins to one another, like, there's healing that healing that takes place. And so I just encourage, like, if maybe there's a intrusive thought or maybe there's a struggle, to be able to say that to somebody else because then we realize, we realize I'm not alone. And there are other people who are with us as well. You know, I think about, like, talking about story and narrative and putting a story on. There was a time where Jesus, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, brought a woman who was caught in adultery to Jesus. And they wanted to shame her. Actually, they wanted to, they wanted to kill her because, you know, according to the law, that was what adultery would lead to, led to, led to death. Jesus is sitting there. They bring this woman up. And it's interesting. He starts drawing in the sand. And we don't know what he was drawing, but he starts drawing in the sand. And then he tells them, he says, hey, let whichever one of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now, what happens next is that all of the religious leaders, they start dropping those stones and then they, they leave. And it's the woman who's standing there with Jesus. Jesus said, where are your accusers? He said, well, I don't condemn you either. He said, no, go and sin no more. Mm-hmm. And... He is the only one who was without sin. Yeah. But he didn't pick up a stone. Because he would take, he would become the sacrifice for our sin, for her sin, for all of us. And I think the reason that he drew in the sand is to draw the attention off of her nakedness, off of what she would have felt in that moment um, with shame, to draw the attention off of her and to draw the attention because when somebody's writing in the sand everybody wants to know what are they writing Mm -hmm. and maybe he wrote the names of people who in that group in that group who were you know committed the same sin right Right, right. but but you just see the 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 beauty of jesus as a as a rabbi and his you know his his willingness to to remove shame to take shame off of other people and then to be able to set her free and to go i don't condemn you either just go go and live And I think every time we fail, we can come to him and because he's not a favor of persons. He loves us all the same. He loves us like he does that that woman. We bring our shame to him and he loves the shame off of us. Wow. He loves the shame off of us. Gosh, that's so powerful. And I think it also brings up the point that it's so important to 
to find people that you feel safe sharing yeah. with because, you know, that's part of it. It's like people that have so much toxic shame, they don't want to share because they don't feel safe because they feel like they're being judged. And one of the reasons, you know, over the years in in the work that I do, I've led with my own shame of like, here here's mine, right? Because it, it, it enables people to, to be safe to share their own and know that they're not going to be judged. And I think that, you know, different there's different elements for different people that they need to feel that safety. But I think part of it is for, for me, at least it was when I met people that knew Jesus and knew the love of Jesus. It's almost like my shame and my sin didn't matter mm -hmm. because the, the love was there and the acceptance was there. And it almost like tore down the walls of secrecy because there was this element of safety. And so I think, you know, surrounding yourself, if, I mean, we all have them too. We know those people in our lives where we're like, we're not safe to be who, yeah. who we really are. They're going to judge us. Right. And that's okay. You don't have to go audit all of your friends, but you know who people are and know who people are in your life and really seek out that safety for yourself, psychological safety, almost to be able to be who you are and get that help. Because the first step to acknowledging that you have a problem is is first and foremost acknowledging yourself but feeling able to to voice it and get mm -hmm. that support and be heard and have it received yeah i think all of us have a sense of intuition but like spidey sense right i mean yeah. we we can tell when somebody's safe or when they're not and if that's been damaged either because of trauma or because of what's happened in the past i'm like you can start with a counselor but the moment then you share it to somebody is no longer a secret Absolutely. you know and so i think i think go to a professional i think you would start when we talk about you know pastor pastors by by law confidentiality is is required. But I'm say if if you don't feel there if you don't feel safe there, go to a counselor. I think looking at friends, I, I mean I think it's like trusting them with a little bit at a time, you know. And I think sure. learning over time who you can trust and that in those um in those deeper ways, it just really is a really is a gift. It, it halves our sorrows and it doubles our joys, you know, well, to have yeah. a friend like that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. So coming to the next belief, which, um, or lie, we should say is I've been this way for far too long. Mm -hmm. So it's another way of saying like, I'm far too gone. But like, again, when we look at our historically, how, who we've been and how we've shown up and we think like, no, you don't understand. I've been this way my entire life. You're telling me that there is hope. Yeah. What would you say to that? So when Jesus was on the cross, there were two people. There was one on his left, one on his right, and uh, and he one was a murderer, one was a thief. And he goes to Jesus. He's like, one curses him, and the other says, "Will you remember me? You know, today, will you?" And so I'm like, okay, that guy had been there, been that way his entire life, and here he was coming to the end of his life, and Jesus tells him, "Surely today, like you'll be with me." Like the moment at the end of his life, like that, he's on his deathbed. And he puts his faith and his trust and Jesus brings him a word of peace and just like, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of you. So I'm like, I don't know of another picture in scripture of somebody where with their entire life. And even if it is to that moment to know that, that coming home. So I would say at any point we come home and, and I think, you know, when I think of people that I know in, in my life, I think about you and my grandfather who was 86 years old and he lived a certain kind of way and it was that I mean, we still have the chair that he was sitting in. I mean, he, he passed away years ago, but we still held on to the chair where he put his faith and trust and he finally knew forgiveness. Mm. And, um, and so to receive forgiveness from God. And so he received that forgiveness from God in that chair. And I think at that moment he was able to forgive himself, you know, and that, so that chair is a picture that, that no matter how long you've been in that place, that, transformation is always possible and i saw it in his life yeah. you know, so absolutely yeah. and you know what just came to mind for me too is like this idea of you know for for my own versions of i've been this way for far too long one thing that i can look back and say well i never addressed it like it was a spiritual struggle mm -hmm. you know so it's like well what are you what have you done i know a lot of women i talk to they're like oh i've done therapy i've done this and that and like, well, have you ever, in the case of, you know, their relationship with food in their bodies, have you ever taken like a brain-based approach? And then if people do have a spiritual life, I'm like, have you ever taken a spiritual approach to this? So yeah. part of it too is like, you know, what have you been doing to address, you know, the thing that you've been air quotes doing for as long as you can remember? And have you ever given it over to God yeah. and surrendered it and, you know, released, relinquished these chains of control, which are just, they're such a, a facade in yeah. a way, you yeah. know? And I think that's one of the lies. One of the lies is that 
I knew for me and struggles and things that I've had in my past, I knew for me there was there was one struggle where I thought I'll always remember the last time. And I was like, I'll know that I have breakthrough when I can't remember the last time. Okay. And for that particular struggle, dude, like I can't remember the last time. Yeah. You know, and so I, I have evidence in my life that, you know, the lie was I'll always be able to remember if I can't now. So I think that's, and if that can happen with me, like yeah. that can happen with anybody, you know? And, uh, and so I think getting around some other people who have experienced the breakthrough and the transfer, and then there's hope. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then having conversation about like, well, how, how has that been true, you know, for you? How has that? And I think that's one of the gifts of AA. Yeah, getting in a community with some people, having a conversation about our vulnerability in that place of surrender where we're not in surrender by ourselves. Right. We're in community with others. So. Yeah, and you're almost borrowing other people's faith and borrowing right. other people's beliefs. Yeah. You know, until you build your own. That's right. You know. So I love that. Hi, I'm Cindy Crawford, and I'm the founder of Meaningful Beauty. Well, I don't know about you, but, like, I never liked being told, oh, wow, you look so good for your age. Like, why even bother saying that? Why don't you just say you look great at any age, every age? That's what Meaningful Beauty is all about. We create products that make you feel confident in your skin at the age you are now. Meaningful Beauty. Beautiful skin at every age. Learn more at MeaningfulBeauty.com. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand. It's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. Good sleep should come naturally. And with the new Natural Hybrid mattress, it can. A collaboration between award-winning mattress brand Lisa and home design favorite West Elm, the Natural Hybrid is the culmination of these two companies' shared values. Premium materials, meticulous craftsmanship, and sustainable practices. Made with natural latex, responsibly sourced natural wool, and environmentally safe foams, the Natural Hybrid elevates your sleep sanctuary. Indulge your senses and supports a greener tomorrow. Plus, when you purchase the natural hybrid, you're also helping fuel Lisa's work with shelters and those in need. Since 2015, Lisa has donated more than 40,000 mattresses to ensure children and families have a safe place to sleep. Don't put off a good night's sleep any longer. Get a Lisa mattress today for a sound sleep tonight. Visit lisa.com slash iHeart. That's l-e-e-s-a dot com slash iHeart. Everyone knows therapy is great for solving problems, but getting therapy has its own problems too, like finding the right therapist, fitting into their schedule, and of course, the cost. Well, BetterHelp can solve those problems. It's totally online and built around your schedule. It's surprisingly affordable too. Connect with a credentialed therapist by phone, video, or online chat, all from the comfort of your home. Visit BetterHelp.com to learn more and save 10% on your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. Okay, this is a big one, I'm sure. The God is mad at me lie. You know, they feel like maybe they've disappointed him. Again, there's that toxic shame. God is bad at me. Talk to us about that lie. Yeah, I think if... If your God is mad at you, you might have the wrong one. Mm, amen. You know, like, Can you say more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think where Jesus will go back where he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The only time we really see Jesus mad, well, there were a couple times, but they were. it was like in the temple where he's flipping over tables. And the reason that he did that is because the the religious leaders, they had, well, I mean, they're, they're people who had set up these um, these tables to try to try to take advantage of Gentiles who were trying to get in and offer their sacrifice. And so they were like upcharging them and they were, um, they were just trying to take advantage. And so they had turned the court of Gentiles, the place where those Gentiles would worship into a marketplace. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus turns over those tables and he's like, my father's house is a house of prayer because that would have been the place where, where the Gentiles would have come in and been able to pray. And I think that's, 
that's what makes Jesus mad is when people create other barriers for other people to encounter the heart of God, you know? Yeah. So does Jesus get mad? Yeah, but it's not with people because they admit their own brokenness and because of their sin and because they're, and when that, that mad thing, it was because there were barriers. And so I think what we see in Jesus, he, he's tearing down every barrier and his heart is a heart of unconditional love for people to, to draw near. And so if you feel like God is, is mad, you know, at you, um, I said, you might have the wrong one, mm. you know, because his heart is full of love and in pursuit. He just wants you to come home. It's just, it's, he, he wants you to come home to, come to him. Uh, and I think the enemy wants us to believe that so that we'll stay far off. Absolutely. And just we think, well, I got to work and like act a certain way so that then God likes you. He likes you right now. And he's in a really good mood toward you. <laughs> no, but yeah, we just we just asked him. He's, 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 in, right, he's in a really, really yeah. good good mood, and that's what it means to be loved mm-hmm. unconditionally. But so many of us have never known, you know, love yeah. like that. Absolutely, yeah. And that's where I would say try on a new story. Mm-hmm. Like you see, you've got the wrong God. It's like, yeah, that's not the God I know. Yeah. The God I know would just be so happy yeah. that you're showing up now. Like I said, the, the God that I do, He didn't care that it was a rabbi or a pastor. It happened to be a pastor. It didn't care that it was a church or a temple. It happened to be a church. He was just glad that at 35 years old, that was five years ago. Yeah. I just said yes. I I want to know you. Yeah. You know. And if he got mad in the scriptures, it was because people were putting up barriers so that people could know that he's not mad. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I really like him. Right? Yeah. I mean, he was he For was sure. wanting people to know that so much that he was tearing those things. And so that kind of religion that would cause people to think that, like, that's the thing that grieves yeah. his heart. Absolutely. And that's actually a perfect segue into the next lie or belief is, you know, a lot of people, they grew up in a certain type of, you know, religion or, you know, the good, bad, right, wrong, should, shouldn't kind of mentality, the shame driven kind of mentality. So this idea of like, no, you know, I, the whole God conversation, like, I don't really want that. I grew up around it and I saw what it did to my mom or my dad and yeah. I just, I don't like it. So what would you say to that? It might even just be a continuation of that last conversation. I think going back, I think this is so powerful from your story of like just go, going back to the Gospels, going back to the historical Jesus, going back to those narrow, narrative accounts and just asking, God, if you're real, you know, Jesus, if you're real, would you reveal who you really are to me? Because there are, there are people who get Jesus wrong. Like there are people who have taken you know, the Christ in Scripture and have misconstrued who he is. So asking, asking him, reveal who you really are to me. And I think there's a personal encounter and get around, get around people, get around some people who, like I said, you, you know, look for the authentic, authentic Christ. If you get around a, a faith group that doesn't talk about, like that say they're Christian, but they never talk about Jesus. They never use the word. Yeah. And be, be concerned, you know, right. like we want to go back to who is the historical Jesus and be on that process of, of, of having a relationship with him, not rules. He's about the heart. He's after yeah. the heart. So. Absolutely. And I think how many times have, as humans, I know for myself, I've met somebody and I've totally prejudged them mm-hmm. or made up a story about who they are. And then once I get to know them, I'm like, wow, that is not who I thought them to be. And they're amazing. Or, or you know, sometimes it's the opposite, people, but, you know, but in this case, I'm like, try on this story that you don't know, like you, you haven't met the, the God that you think you met, if you think that he's mad at you, you're far gone, right. that it's this, you know, again, you have to earn it. There's the shame driven, whatever upbringing you had. And also I want to invite you into like, you are allowed to choose who you want to be today yeah. as an adult. Like yeah. it doesn't have to be, you know, you're always going to be influenced by what you're influenced by. But like, again, what if you started choosing what you want to be influenced by in this conversation? And, and again, wipe the slate clean, give yourself permission you know, this is coming from me. I I was not guided or led in a spirituality or even a religious based conversation growing up. And it's something that you can choose at any time, any age. That's right. Yeah, that's good. Right where you're at. Let's actually talk about these last two, which sure. and we can kind of put them together because I think they go hand in hand. But one is, you know, what would my family think if I just started trying on this God conversation now? So again, maybe you have your you're Jewish, you're Catholic, Hindu, atheist, whatever it is. But then also, like, what would my friends think? So maybe you're used to hanging around people and, like, this, the central part of your connection is 
drinking or gossiping or, you know, I know with a lot of my clients, it's like, you know, talking about our weight and, you know, and talking about that kind of things or shaming ourselves, right? Um, being frivolous with money because that can be contagious, right? Yeah. Um, having idols, right? Fill in the blank, chasing whatever, chasing relationships, you know, cars, money, whatever, you know, so when your influence is not really aligned with, who, with the direction that you're going in, um, and the the belief or the lie is like, oh my gosh, what would my family think? They're gonna they're gonna judge me. They're not gonna approve. What would my friends think? They're gonna judge me. They're not gonna approve. Yeah. What would you say to that? Yeah. I mean, I think we're we're wired and we're created a certain way where we we want other people's like we want other people's approval. Yeah. We can live our lives based on the fear of man, which is a prison to live in. And so we can go around thinking, man, I, I need, I need everybody's approval for everything that I, that I do. And that is like, that's just, it's a miserable way to live. And, um, and so I think we can be grateful for our families of origin. There are a lot of things we can be grateful for and not necessarily be controlled by them. Yeah. And there is an influence in our life, but I think to start at that place of gratitude and we'll be grateful for our families and we'll be grateful for friends but be in that pursuit of truth. Mm-hmm. And when we look at Jesus' life, like th- his family like thought he was crazy. <laughs> like, I mean, there was a moment where where they were standing outside of the house and they're trying to they're trying to talk him out of fulfilling his mission and doing the thing that but then at the end we see Mary when he's on the cross. You remember Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and one of his primary sources, you know, for the story of Jesus' life was Mary. And James was one of his brothers that didn't believe. And Paul says, this is one of the evidences of the resurrection is because James, who was this brother of Jesus who thought he was crazy, who didn't believe, but then saw him when he was resurrected and then becomes a leader, ultimately is, is killed as, a, as one of the church leaders in Jerusalem. And he found Jesus after the resurrection, after he saw Jesus raised from the dead, he's like, he's worth giving me. He's not just my brother, Jesus. He's, can you imagine having a brother? be the messiah right i mean you know but like i mean i know what feeling compared to my brother you know and my sister like having a brother that's perfect you know and and james thought he was crazy as when jesus was and then he sees the resurrected christ and he's like no he was who he says he was he is who he says he is and then he lays his life down for it and so you look at this you look at the story like jesus knew what it was like hebrews talks about he has known every like he's known every struggle. He can empathize with us in our weakness. Like we have this high priest who has gone, but he used that phrase like this. We have one who has gone before us and he lived life perfectly. He's endured. He knows what it's like to be rejected by family and yet fulfill the call that he's. None of us can fulfill the call that God has for us or the mission or the purpose that he has for us in life. And have you know our earthly parents mm-hmm. approval or have our friends approve of us all that that's a very it's a very small mm-hmm. life there were people who didn't want us to move up to nashville to pastor this we just knew it was what god was calling us to calling us to do yeah. and so i think it, at some point you have to make a decision am i going to live to to please people mm-hmm. or am i going to live to please god and whatever, whatever that means. And Jesus said it this way. He said, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Yeah. And so that deny, deny self, yeah. take up a cross. There is a suffering. There is sacrifice. There's, yes, but that's, he says, if you, if you, when you lose your life, that's when you really find it. Mm-hmm. Like when you surrender, just like we talked about last, surrender, living with open hand. Um, that's right. And it's, it's hard. It is, it's hard, but it's, Remember when I was over in, um, I was over in talking with a man, he was Muslim background and he had come to faith in Jesus. I had a friend who said, he was a Jewish friend. He said, the only way that, that Jews and Muslims come together is Jesus. Like that's it. That's the only way. Like there was, and it was in, you know, it was in Palestinian territory when I met this. Jesus or falafel. Jesus or falafel. Yeah, those two things he got together. But this man was telling me, you know, I was over in Palestinian territory. And he, um, this man was in, it was, he was in hiding and he was like, his parents had put out a hit on his life because he had found Jesus. And it became, he, he went on Facebook and he went on Facebook and he, he looked for a Christian on Facebook, found a woman in Michigan who had 
Christian I never started a conversation with her and ends up coming to coming to faith and he was in hiding when I met him and I was just like man what it cost him like what it cost him to put faith in Jesus but when I when I would look at him and I could look in his eyes I still I kept on to he had some he had some tea and there was some sage in the in the tea and I kept on there was some kind of I kept, I don't have no idea, but I kept it as a memory of that conversation because I'm like, here's a man who knows what it is to, to sacrifice, to lay down for what matters most. But you could see in his eye, he was, he was free. He was free of that fear of man, you know, and truly found himself in that. And, uh, and so I just think how, how wild it is for us to be sitting here right now talking about (laughs) that man and that conversation, but just going, there's a, there's a freedom that comes a freedom from the fear of man, which for so many people controls them their entire life. Absolutely. But it's through that surrender that we truly find our lives. Yeah. And, you know, when your identity is rooted in the opinions of other people or your perception of what other people think or, you know, even the air quotes authority in your life, whatever your authority is. And, you know, when you have when you give so much weight to that authority, it by default, your certainty in who you are is going to be kind of you know, frail or weakened. And, but what I've discovered is like, as your certainty gets filled in and as you create more authority and in the knowingness of who you are, it's not that other people's opinions don't matter. They'll always matter, but they don't make a difference in how you choose to show up. And I think that's part of what happens when you get your identity rooted in something so much deeper and so much bigger than, and I'm not, I'm discounting the weight of how we you know, we, we definitely care about what our family thinks and all of that, right? I mean, it, I, I shared about it in one of the first episodes about how I, I called my parents and I was like, listen, I do care what you think, but I'm also, I'm a Christian, you yeah. know, and I'm Jewish, you yeah. know, and it took me a while. So I think part of it is like giving yourself that space to to keep it sacred until you know what it is and then share. But the, again, build that certainty, build your own sense of authority and who you are and the knowingness, and it's not going to be so scary. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, there, I mean, there are so many beliefs and lies that we could go through and yeah. maybe this will become a series, but thank you so much for sharing. Um, just anything in terms of this idea of, you know, meeting people in their current beliefs of like, I can't have a relationship with God, or maybe it's the worldly views or the unbiblical beliefs, keeping them from having this relationship with God and carrying around this toxic shame. Um, obviously we shared new truths and new beliefs and obviously our invitation is just to try this on and try on this new possibility, but just to kind of put a wrapper on it, what would you, what, what would you want to leave everybody with? Uh, I'll just tell you what I do. Um, I've got this uh, shortcut on my keyboard, on my computer. Uh, I journal in Evernote every day and I, I 10 D D C and I don't know why, it, but when I push in 10 D C it's 10 declarative statements that just pop up. And I've written out these statements that tell me, you know, who I am. And I need those reminders every single day. And so um, I don't do it every single day. I do it when I need that reorientation. When I need that reminder, I do it a lot of days Mm -hmm. because I need that a lot of days. So I don't think wherever we're at on the journey, we need that reminder, that recalibration for the soul. Mm -hmm. So some of mine are like, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. Just remember, I'm a man of integrity. I love my wife. I'll exhaust myself, you know, to love her, serve her, care for her. I remind myself I'm a, I'm a father who loves my children, and I'm going to lead them to truth and to wisdom and lead by grace, you know. Yeah, I write these down um, or just it's a shortcut, so I write it down. Really, but I just read through them. And so I think so many of us, we have this, this background noise telling us a different story. And... Uh, I think it's super helpful to go ahead and write write out who you are and who God has called you to be, who he's made you to be, um, so that you can return to that place you know, every single day. The best way to combat lies is with truth. Mm-hmm. And so I think to be intentional with the truth, write out those 10 declarative statements, write out the truth so that we can be transformed, so that we can be made new by the, by the renewing of our mind. Yeah. I know that for me, one of the prayers I prayed when I first started just kind of unpeeling back these lies and I wrote it down actually is God I don't know you but I want to know you and I'm here was the first thing I kept repeating that over and over again but it was because part of it too is like just acknowledging that we had these lies or these untruths and now it's like okay show me what to believe it's almost like this open-ended dot 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 conversation right 
So I know I was just always like, you know, give me the eyes to see what I'm not seeing and give me the wisdom to understand what I'm not understanding and give me faith to believe what I'm not yet believing. Because again, the faith thing was a big step for me. And then show me who I really am, like not who I'm trying to hustle to be. Show me how you see me and give me new visions of who I am and who I can continue to grow into and plant new seeds in my heart. Because for me, when I recognizing the untruths or the lies was step one, but coming up with new truths, it took some time. And so that was part of the pray, like the type of prayers I would ask is just like, God, I'm not sure what my new beliefs are yet, but like, I feel like you'll help, you'll show them to me. So just keep, you know, working on me Mm -hmm. and just keep showing up, you know? So that's also like an interim step if you're not sure, like, because I know the declarative statements that you have, I was listening to them and I'm like, I think I want to put some of those yeah. in my vows or have my, my Charles put them in his vows, you know? Yeah. No, just kidding. But that being said, it's like to get to those declarative statements, I can only imagine how much heart soul went into that for you, yeah. the knowingness of who you are, <laughs> you know? And so that's the kind of thing where if you're listening to this and you're like, I want those, like, just pray for them. Yeah. He'll, he'll reveal. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think pray for him. And then I think that's one of the gifts of, of scripture. It's like, we don't have to wonder what, what God thinks. Yeah. He's already revealed. Like, and so I think to go to, go to scripture and just even open up and say, God, would you reveal to me who you are? Would you reveal to me who I am? And just take note and take notes. It's good. Oh, so good. Well, thank you so much for being here. Just set the tone. You guys are going to be hearing more from Kevin and his amazing wife, Ree. Thank you so much for being here and we'll sign off for now. Good. Bye. We will be back with more What's God Got to Do With It. But in the meantime, I would love to hear from you. So just tell me where you are in your own story or maybe what questions you have. You know, where do you feel like you need more clarity or wisdom or direction in your own journey? I definitely want to hear from you. So head on over to what's God got to do with it.com and scroll down to the form to share your thoughts, questions, or feedback instantly. That's what's God got to do with it.com. And if you like this podcast and want to hear more, follow, like, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts to get your weekly dose of what's God got to do with it. New episodes drop every Tuesday. And while you're there, be sure to rate and review to show your support. It really means so much. What's God Got to Do With It is an iHeartRadio podcast on the Amy Brown Podcast Network. It's written and hosted by me, Leanne Ellington. Executive produced by Elizabeth Fazio. Post-production and editing by Houston Tilly. And original music written by Cheryl Stark and produced by Adam Stark. The South Dakota Stories, Volume 7. My trip to South Dakota was the best summer ever. Now I don't need to go to Mars because I've been to the Badlands. And I caught a bigger walleye than Dad when we went to the Missouri River. Then I rode my bike through these huge rocks called needles. Ooh, I also saw my first herd of bison, even a fuzzy furry baby one. I can't wait to go back and see more. There's so much South Dakota, so little time. Zero Foxtrot isn't just a brand. It's a way of life. Founded and operated by veterans, Zero Foxtrot's unique apparel and gear echoes the grit of the warrior culture. Zero Foxtrot dedicates itself to producing content, honoring the sacrifices of forgotten heroes of the past, and connecting history to the present. Embark on a journey with Zero Foxtrot today at ZeroFoxtrot.com. It's not merely our products. It's about the ethos that we embody. Rugged, resilient, and timeless. Tired of restless nights? At Lisa, we know good sleep is essential for mental, physical, and emotional health. From memory foam mattresses to hybrids that keep you cool all night long, Lisa's mattresses offer exceptional comfort and support with free delivery and 100 nights to try out your mattress in the comfort of your home. For a limited time, save up to $700 off select mattresses plus two free pillows. Go to lisa.com slash iHeart for an additional $50 off mattresses and select goods. Exclusions apply. See lisa.com for more details. What's up, y'all? Janice Torres here. And I'm Austin Hankwitz. We're the hosts of Mind the Business, Small Business Success Stories, a podcast presented by iHeartRadio's Ruby Studios and Intuit QuickBooks. 
Join us as we speak with small business owners about the tools they use to turn their ideas into success. From finding that initial spark of entrepreneurship to organizing payments and invoices, we've got you covered. So follow and listen to Mind the Business Small Business Success Stories on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts.